It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. People who engage in a mindfulness practice like meditation or yoga will often speak of its benefits, a better attention span, less anger, a reduction of stress, even an easing of depression. Well, a new book tackles the question of why, scientifically, this may be. And it argues that Buddhism offers a way to overcome the constraints imposed on the human mind by natural selection. The book is called Why Buddhism is True, The Science and Philosophy of Meditation and Enlightenment. It's by Robert Wright, a visiting professor of science and religion at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. His previous books include The Moral Animal and the Evolution of God. Robert Wright is also the founder of the website Mindful Resistance, and in part two of this conversation, we're going to discuss that. But for now, we're talking about the book Why Buddhism is True, and very happy that Robert Wright is here with us. So, Robert, welcome. Let's start with the field that you are known uh, to be an expert in, evolutionary psychology, and what it can tell us about how the human mind works and why Buddhism, um, as I said, can help us overcome some of the constraints that uh, our mind imposes on us. Yeah, well, it turns out that evolutionary psychology echoes a couple of important themes in Buddhism. I mean, uh, I think uh, a very, very important, if not the main message of Buddhism, is that the reason we suffer and the reason we make other people suffer is that we don't see the world clearly. We have illusions about ourselves, about other people, about the world, and these things lead to suffering. And there is a lot of suffering, as the Buddha is said to have observed. And evolutionary psychology, uh, says that, first of all, the human mind was not designed to always see things clearly. Uh, natural selection, in some cases, actually favors uh, illusions, you might say, um, because after all, all natural selection cares about, or quote, quote, cares about, since it's not really a conscious process, is, is what traits will get an animal's genes into the next generation. And if having an illusion, having a distorted view of yourself or of other people, has helped get genes into the next generation, then distortion can actually be built into the human mind. And then the other thing that evolutionary psychology tells us is uh, it's natural in a, in a certain sense that we are prone to suffering because we're also not designed to be happy. Our happiness is not high on natural selection's agenda. Uh, because again, if being unhappy or anxious or or restless or dissatisfied has gotten genes into the next generation, over time, uh, then those things will be encouraged uh, by natural selection. So we'll, we'll be inclined uh, to become dissatisfied with things easily and, and to want more. And gratification will tend to evaporate, as a lot of us you know, have observed it actually does. We may have noticed that in our lives. So you know, just in short, Buddhism says we are prone to not seeing the world clearly and to suffering, to unhappiness. And there's a connection between these two things. And natural selection. Uh, reinforce our evolutionary psychology reinforces the idea that we're we're uh, prone to delusion, to not seeing things clearly, and to suffering. And I argue in the book that there is a connection, indeed, between these two things, and that we can uh, make ourselves happier and make the world a better place by trying to clarify our vision. Right, and, and you point out in the book that the part of the reason why, or a main reason why, we're prone towards seeking gratification is because we need it. Uh, in order to pass genes to the next generation. So for example, if we just ate one meal and that was all for us, then we wouldn't need to eat again. Or if we just had sex once, uh, then we wouldn't need to have sex again. But the problem is that couldn't help us create uh, uh, the next generations. That, that's right. I mean, if you imagine an animal that ate one meal and then just said, okay, I'm good, you know, and never got hungry again, never got, you know, kind of dissatisfied with things enough to go pursue more food, uh, obviously, that animal wouldn't wouldn't last long. Same with sex. Uh, an animal that has sex only once is is going to get out competed by other animals of the same species. Uh, and so this this uh, seems to be why we're we're on what psychologists call the hedonic treadmill. We keep seeking more because the gratification we get never lasts, and we tend to suffer from the illusion that it will last longer than it does. Right? I mean, when you when you're gunning for some big promotion or you're thinking about some great thing you're going to buy, you're kind of focusing on, on how good it's going to feel when you get it. And you're not thinking about how fast that is going to, uh, that feeling is going to evaporate. 
And according to Buddhism, that is an illusion. That's a, that's a central example in Buddhism of, of an illusion. Um, now, the difference between Buddhism and evolutionary psychology is that Buddhism doesn't just diagnose the human condition. Uh, it actually has a prescription. It, it offers us something to do about the problem, and, and meditation is a big part of that. Right. So, okay. So, in short, we are trying to go through life using minds that are designed not for the purpose of necessarily trying to make us happy or even achieve what we want, but have a very simple purpose, which is survival for the next generation, which means that we're applying the faculties of the mind uh, towards things or, or in ways that aren't necessarily, that they weren't necessarily designed for. They were designed for a, a different purpose than maybe we're using them for. So if I have that correct, how does Buddhism help us handle that and maybe correct yeah. where, where it steers us off course? Yeah. Well, first of all, you're right. I mean, there's actually two problems. One is we weren't designed to be happy in the first place. Uh, but secondly, uh, the modern environment is so different from the environment that natural selection kind of designed us for that there's the things that, you know, there's even more suffering. So like anxiety is natural. Uh, and that causes suffering in a natural environment, something more like a hunter-gatherer environment. But in a modern world, there's all these weird things we do that weren't part of, of a hunter-gatherer environment, like give, give talks in front of a bunch of people we don't know and so on. And so th there's, even, uh, there's even more anxiety. As for what meditation can do about things like this, mindfulness meditation in particular helps us develop a different kind of relationship to our feelings. So what you do in mindfulness meditation is you start by focusing on your breathing, but as your mind gets calmer, you find yourself able to kind of look at feelings that normally you would just react to. Like in, you feel anxiety and, and start thinking, you know, oh no, th things are, you know, things are gonna go horribly, or what, what, what can I do? Can I talk myself into thinking they won't or whatever? Once your mind is in a calm state, you, you take a different approach is you just observe a feeling like anxiety. Uh, and if you get, good at that uh, as a meditator that takes a lot of the suffering out of the feeling it's more like observing it uh you know from a more kind of objective point of view in a certain sense the feeling doesn't go away you still experience the feeling but because you're paying attention to it it has less of a grip on you and the same with all kinds of uh feelings that we're often better off without uh you know things like hatred anger envy uh sadness meditation helps us develop kind of a different uh, relationship to them and be less their slave. And this sort of contradicts with an image that many of us have about ourselves, which is that we're in control of our own minds. And I was really interested by, in the book, your rendering of what the Buddhism, uh, uh, sorry, of, of what the Buddha had to say about this, about how we are not actually at all in control right. of our minds. Can you tell us about what he taught? Yeah, there's this kind of crazy sounding Buddhist idea called not self, the, which, you know, which means that in some sense the self doesn't exist. And you might say, well, what does that mean? One thing it means is that our sense that the conscious self is the, the big CEO, it's making all the decisions, it's creating all the thoughts, uh, that that's actually mistaken, okay? That, that that's kind of an illusion. And modern psychology is actually corroborated uh, the Buddhist claim that this is uh, that this is a very misleading sense of things. I mean, for example, there are experiments uh, that that seem to indicate that when we feel we're we're consciously deciding to do something, like just something simple, like push a button, that actually the physical processes in the brain that that initiate the pushing are underway before we feel as if we've made the decision. And 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 uh, there's there's other evidence that we're not as in control as we think we are that, that uh, we actually, in a certain sense, that the unconscious mind sometimes kind of makes up stories about our actual motivations for doing things, and the conscious mind believes them. Um, and here, too, meditation, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of ironic. It, it's, it, meditation, in a certain sense, helps you accept that you're not in control, but in the process, helps you, or maybe I should say, quote you, according to strict Buddhist doctrine, um, be more in control, because once you let go of the idea that, that you are in charge and just do a little more in the way of kind of observing what's going on in your mind and seeing feelings and thoughts, it's kind of just showing up, 
uh, more than kind of being projected by the conscious you, uh, that actually helps you uh, lead a more kind of reflective life, a less reactive life. Um, so in a certain sense, uh, accepting that you're not as in control as you think you are helps you become more in control. I know it sounds uh, paradoxical, but that's the way it seems to work. But f my problem here is that feelings are so strong in people. I mean, at least, you know, in my own life, the feelings that I've experienced that I felt guided by, that it's been impossible for me to not act on them. Why do you think that is? And how can mindfulness help us get around that? Well, the reason they're so hard to resist is that they are designed by natural selection to be hard to resist. I mean, that is, you know, natural selection's agenda, what, what it, quote, wants us to do. Again, it's not a conscious being, but uh, that, is, that agenda is kind of inscribed in feelings. Feelings are the levers that it uses to get us to do uh, it, it, its bidding, so to speak. So uh, whether it's a feeling like uh, lust or just a desperate desire for more status or hatred of a rival or whatever, the feelings are trying to get us to do the kinds of things that, at least in the environment of, of our evolution, uh, tended to get more genes into the next generation. So they're designed to be hard to resist. And that's why, uh, you know, meditation is not easy. It's not even easy to calm down and focus on your breath. That takes a lot of practice to, to, to just, you know, since our minds just naturally wander from thought to thought to thought. Um, and then it, it takes continued practice before you, you start to develop a different relationship uh, to your feelings. I, I personally, I am not a natural meditator at all. I had to go to like a one week silent meditation retreat before I got the hang of it at all. So it's not, it's not easy. Um, and it's not easy by design, you might say. Uh, I mean, uh, natural selection, uh, again, it, it, it doesn't create organisms that can easily defy its, its agenda, but I, but I think defiance is possible. And again, uh, I think if you defy its agenda, you you can be happier. You can be a better person, uh, and and uh, you know a less destructive person. And I think you you in the process begin seeing things more clearly, seeing the world uh, more clearly, see sizing people up uh, in a more objective way, and 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 not in a way that's uh, that's so judgmental. Uh, that's kind of whose judgment is biased, you might say, by your own kind of self-serving point of view. Okay, so this is a bit of a tangent here, but I'm curious about your thoughts on the implications here um, based on this theory for something like love. Because if sex, for example, is um, evolutionary psychology's uh, incentive for procreation, then what does that say about love? Because obviously, you know, love... Uh, is a good path towards procreation. I mean, the odds are that if you're in love with someone, the odds are probably higher that you're going to make a baby with them. So is love also biology's incentive structure for uh, procreating and for getting genes into the next generation? And if so, I'm wondering, is that a reason to maybe view love with the same type of skepticism or detachment that you would other uh, human feelings and mechanisms? Well, first of all, I'd say that through mindfulness meditation, you can view all feelings with an initial skepticism and then decide which feelings are wholesome and leading you in a good direction and, and, and not leading you to be either unhappy or a horrible person. Uh, and, and then make a judgment about which feelings uh, you want to follow the guidance of. So, so an initial skepticism, I think, is, a, is a, a fine thing. Now, love, as it happens, has a lot of good properties, I think. Um, it can it can blind you. It's not always good in all circumstances. Uh, it can it can uh, you know it can make you do bad things. But I think uh, but it has a lot of uh, positive manifestations. And your as for your first question, uh, yes, in our species, pair bonding seems to have evolved. In other words, uh, fathers well there are fathers you might say attentive fathers you know males stick around and play a role in rearing the offspring. Not all species are like that. Not even all primate species are like that. Um, but, but in a species with pair bonding, it does make sense that both males and females would have feelings that draw them into lasting attachments uh, with each other. Hmm. 
Um, how do you look at the sort of um, socioeconomic class angle of this, if there is one? Um, in my own experience, whenever I'm comfortable in life, whenever I'm doing well uh, work-wise, whenever I'm not too busy, it's been really easy for me, or it's been way, way easier for me to meditate uh, than it has been when things aren't going so well. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, um, you know, for many people, would love to be able to have the chance to go and do a week-long retreat, would love to even have 20 minutes out of the day when they can meditate, but there are, I think, some class barriers to that. Uh, so, mm. and in my own experience, you know, just even going to mindfulness gatherings, retreats, I tend to notice that it is people who are more privileged and usually more white. Uh, I'm wondering your thoughts on that. Uh, I think that's true. There is a kind of a demographic uh, bias uh, in, in terms of who is most likely to be a meditator, but I think that's changing somewhat. Um, I just did a, a public event with John Kabat-Zinn who, who started uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction a long ago. Uh, and one thing that did is it took mindfulness kind of out of its Buddhist context in a certain sense, so it no longer sounded so much like a religion. And when people think of mindfulness as that, as just this, you know, practical, pragmatic thing you can use, it's more likely to be accepted in public schools, in hospitals, in a variety of places. And so I think you are seeing uh, it taught in some public schools, in more and more public schools, uh, that some of which include low-income students. Um, and then separate from that, there are, uh, in, back to get back to a Buddhist context, uh, I know, for example, I'm in New York, I know people at the Brooklyn Zen Center um, sometimes uh, make a point of going into the schools as volunteers and teaching meditation to troubled kids and so on. Um, I, so I think you're, you're right that, that it's traditionally there's been a kind of a, an upper class and you might even say politically a liberal bias. Well, uh, I, I think that it's to the benefit of the world if more and more people meditate. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that, that, you know, in, in the long run, uh, it, it, the practice can pervade, uh, society much more evenly. Which is a great segue to the second part of our discussion on mindful resistance. Uh, Robert Wright is the author of Why Buddhism is True, The Science and Philosophy of Meditation and Enlightenment. Join us in part two, where we're going to talk about how mindfulness can help us in the age of Trump. Robert Wright, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News.